morning, everyone. Thanks very much for coming. We've actually we've been on a, a nationwide tour, which is actually ending up in Joburg. So this is our, our second last presentation. Um, and the message that we're actually taking to our investors and potential investors is actually very, very simple. It's a very simple message. Despite the fact that the bull market in, in the equity bull market is um, over five years old, we're still finding good opportunities in the equity market. Why? Because there's still pockets of uncertainty in certain parts of, uh, of the equity markets. Um, despite the fact that the, the bond market, and I think in global bond market, uh, the bull market is over 30 years old. Uh, we're still finding opportunities in the bond market as well. Um, more at the front end of the, end of the curve. And there's some very, very good news there. 12-month um, rates, interest rates, um, are now around 7.3%. Um, Ian and I were looking this morning um, and at one of our old presentations going back to 2012, and 12-month and interest rates then were 5.2%. Were so you've seen almost a 2 percentage points rise in short-term interest rates which is great news for savers because it's been a very tough environment to, to invest in um, if you've been a saver. Um, so through the course of the presentation, we're going to come back to a few themes. Um, there are still good opportunities. But what's also important at this junction going forward is what uh, you avoid and in terms of where one, the risks in the market, which one should be, uh, I guess, you know, uh, staying away from. And the African bank, um, let's call it the African bank debacle, uh, was a very good example of um, an environment where we think people have been taking too much risk uh, for additional yield or small amounts of additional yield. And Ian Scott will actually unpack that and spend some time telling you how we avoid those type of risks but where we are finding opportunities in the fixed income space. What I'm going to do to start though is just set the backdrop in terms of the environment that we're operating in and what the environment that we're investing in. Now this is not going to be new news. Um, I know this is a very sophisticated audience. Um, but it's just worth setting the scene and just reflecting and pausing and just, and just reflecting on, on what the environment is uh, like in terms of how we're operating. Um, just to update on our business, this is just a snapshot of the performance of our funds. Um, I think you're well aware of the performance. Uh, we've, got, we've had very good long-term performance, um, in fact, above benchmark and, and above our peers. And, um, you know, this is, this is the out shot. This is the output from our process. We don't focus on performance. We focus on process. And if we get it right and we take a long-term view, uh, we find good opportunities at low risk. Uh, we do believe that our process is going to lend itself to getting the odds in our favor, which will allow us to outperform and generate good long-term returns for our investors. Um, as a snapshot from a business point of view, um, PSG Asset Management is, has been quite successful over the last year in terms of taking market share. You can actually just see the... You know, the, the, you know, the number of people out here today compared to a year ago, we're starting to see some growth and some interest in our products. Um, we've almost doubled our asset base over the last year, and we're getting a lot of momentum. Uh, we're still very small relative to some of our larger peers, um, but, you know, there's, there is some, there's some momentum in terms of our, our flows. Okay, so let's just have a little unpack the, 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 the environment. Um, can you see here? Are you okay? Um, so, central banks... And this is, this, is the, this, this is a grand experiment that everyone's been talking about. Um, central, central banks have pumped almost $15 trillion into the financial system over the last five years. It's 150 trillion rand. I mean, this is a massive, massive amount. And this experiment was in, in, it was, had a very, very simple objective, was to reflate the economy. Um, 2008 and 2009 was one of the, the most severe uh, recessions that we've had in living memory. And they wanted to actually reignite growth. And they pumped a whole lot of money into the system with a view to, you know, to, to start stimulating growth. Unfortunately, the recovery that we've seen in global growth has been quite tepid relative to previous recoveries. And what we have seen is instead of these, these financial assets ending up in the real economy, They've ended, uh, this, this money is ending up in the real economy. It's ended up in financial assets. And what it has done is that it's actually pushed up uh, financial assets. It's pushed up the prices of bonds and, and, and equities and property prices. And it's pushed down yields. And what we've seen is the central banks have actually said in this grand experiment, we're going to push interest rates down to zero. And what they're telling you to do is you've got to go out and take risk. It's a very, very strange. It's a very, very strange sort of situation where a central bank is telling you, the man in the street, to go out and take risk. But that's what they're doing. 
They're forcing you out of cash and money market instruments because they are yielding close to zero in global markets. And they're saying, go out and take risk, invest in equities, invest in, in real estate, invest in government bonds, which are higher risk um, than, than cash. And as I said, what it has done is it's pushed the prices of all these instruments across the curve. And when, and when prices go up, the inverse is the yield on those opportunities falls. So we've seen yields on all asset classes falling over the last five years. So in the search for yield, um, what has happened is that investors have just taken more and more risk. So let me give you an example of this in real time. This chart is the, shows the mortgage origination. Um, it's a, it's a long-term mortgage origin, origination index in the U.S. It's saying um, how much money is banks are banks lending to the man in the street to go out and buy houses. And you can see, you know, going from 2004 to 2006, um, there was a large amount of mortgage origination. Uh, the banks were lending to the man in the street to go and buy houses. Post the financial crisis, you can see that this is actually, uh, this is flatlined. So even though, you know, house, house, the, house, the house, um, house prices are very low in the U.S. and the affordable in index is very high, um, the banks just haven't been lending to the man in the street. What have they been doing? Well, they've been doing something quite simple. They've actually been buying financial assets. And this chart shows uh, a, a chart of the holdings of um, you know, government bonds and, tr and agencies, which are similar to government bonds, on banks' balance sheets in the U.S. And you can see here that, that those holdings are now the highest they've been since the financial crisis. So instead of lending to the man in the street to buy houses, which are real assets, uh, these banks have actually been buying financial assets. As a result, and it's not a surprise, um, you know, yields in the U.S., this is the 10-year government bond yields, have been falling. And these yields are as, you know, as low as they've been uh, in a generation. Now, that's okay you know, when you look at it in the, you know, from, a, you know, from a bigger picture view, but the long-term average yield in the U.S. is around 6%. This is going back to 1970-odd. Uh, um, but what people don't realize is that if you buy government bonds, and this goes to in the same as in South Africa as well, if you buy government bonds and the term of your holding in terms of your investor's horizon is different from the actual duration of that underlying bond, so this is a 10-year government bond, if your investors that you are you know, managing their money, if their time horizon is less than 10 years, you get what you have as a mismatch of duration. You introduce something called durational risk. If bond yields, there's an inverse relationship between the price of a bond and the yield. And if yields rise, all things being equal, the price of the bond falls. And that's expressed as a percentage. So uh, in the US, if, it, you know, if yields rise 100 basis points, bond prices fall 5 or 6%. So you can actually suffer a capital loss. If you hold that bond to maturity, you will pick up a 2.5% yield. It's not a lot. 2.5% over 10 years. Now, that's high compared to some other government bonds, and we'll talk about that in a minute. But if you, if you hold it for less than 10 years and the interest rates move, you could suffer a capital loss. So if bond yields go from where they are at the moment to a long-term average, let's just say they rise another 3 percentage points, you could lose between 15 and 20% capital on those bonds. Something you've got to be very careful about. So it introduced risk, and what we talk about is asymmetry. We think there's more upside risk uh, to bond yields than downside risk. The same goes for South African government bond yields. Um, the problem with South African government bond yields is that the durational risk is actually higher than in the U.S., and it's around about 7 or 8%. So if, if bond yields go from, um, say, around 8% to where, where they are now to 10%, which we think is a more of a, a likely long-term average, two percentage points of additional yield pickup um, you could lose 16% you know, of your capital, 8% 8, 8 times 2%. You know, so that introduces risk into your portfolios. So as a, as a result, we're actually quite cautious about government bonds. And, uh, and, and, you'll, and Ian will, will you know, give some examples and he'll you know, give a little bit more detail. Why buy a government bond yielding 8% when you can buy a 12-month uh, NCD at 7.3%? You're taking so much less risk and you're getting a, a much, uh, you're getting a much better risk return trade-off. But Ian will, will explain that in more detail. The same goes for property. Um, we're quite cautious on the property sector. Yields in the, in the property sector have fallen. Um, I think investors often don't appreciate the underlying risks in investing in geared property vehicles. Um, we think that those are equity-like uh, underlying instruments, and people often think that they're actually low risk. So be careful in property. This is our, our, our view. We don't own any property shares in our, in our portfolios. 
Uh, why? Because we just think yields are too low relative to the underlying risks associated with the property sector where we think there could be overcapacity um, and oversupply. This is just a, 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 a simple snapshot of a fear greed index. You've often heard Warren Buffett saying, you know, be fearful when people are greedy and be greedy when people are, fearful, people are fearful. What this chart does, and it's, it goes into the option market and it looks at how much uh, insurance, how much protection people are buying. When there's a lot of complacency, people aren't buying insurance. And you can see what, right now that the actual cost of insu insurance and the demand for insurance in the financial markets are as low as it's been since 2000. So the market's very, very complacent. As a result, often um, the markets get sloppy. They get lazy in their thinking. They start taking uh, additional risk when they shouldn't do. So this is the message for today. You know, be very, very careful what you invest in. Good opportunities, but you've got to be sifting through, separating the high risk uh, from the good risk return trade-offs. So the world today, let's give you a little bit of a snapshot to bring us all together. 81% of global equities um, are domiciled in markets where there's zero interest rates. Eight out of 10 of, of e global equities by market capitalization. 56% of global GDP is currently supported by zero interest rate policies. More than, more than half. 45% of all government bonds are yielding less than 1%. 1%. I mean, inflation in the global markets is running somewhere between 1.5% and 2%. 2% in the U.S., probably around 1.5% in Europe. You're not getting a real pickup here. It's amazing. U.S. corporate bonds uh, returns are at record highs. There's a lot of risk-taking in corporate bonds. And it's not dissimilar to the South African market. And you've seen um, a lot of people were caught on the wrong side of the African um, you know, sort of trade. And as a result, I think there's been some excessive risk-taking. And we're seeing record bond lows, uh, record bond yields in Germany, France, Spain, and Italy. Sean and I were looking at a chart yesterday afternoon in the airport as we were flying up. Going back, you know, some of these government bond, yield, uh, government bond charts go back to the 1700s in Europe. And we're having record low bond yields since the 1700s. I and mean, these are interesting times that we, we're living in and we're operating in. Okay, so this is not a central scenario for us, but what we're saying is let's just be careful that when this process reverses, and at some stage it will reverse, that's I think the, the, uh, the night and day effect of, 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 mark, of global markets. As and when this process reverses, when central banks start raising interest rates, effectively what they're saying is um, they're going to do, they're saying in reverse, guys, you've got to start taking less risk. What we'll see is that money will start f flowing out of, out of riskier assets back into less risky assets and as a result, you'll see asset prices will fall and yields will start rising and you'll get better, better risk-adjusted returns. So as I said, it's not a central scenario for us, but it's something always to keep in the backdrop when you're investing. Okay, so that's the, that's the, that's the environment we're operating in. Um, how is PSG Asset Management equipped to invest in these type of environments? The, simple, the first thing and the most important thing is to have a very, very simple philosophy and know what you're looking for. Now, uh, you, you, those of you who have heard us talk before, well, you would know that we talk about our three M's. I'm not going to go into detail, but it's just a very, very simple um, you know, reminder. What we're looking for are, are businesses, equities, with a strong business model, which is called the moat. Remember going back in medieval times, the, the, the moat is, a, is the wall of water that, that, um, that was um, built around a castle to protect the inhabitants. Businesses are similar. We're looking for businesses with these barriers to entry, this moat around them that protects the returns on those businesses, the margins, and the growth pro prospects. And what we're trying to find all the time is understand the business and understand that the moat they, that they have around them. Not all businesses are created equal. And when Sean puts up his t the top 10 holdings, you'll see that some of these businesses we think have got exceptionally strong moats. They've got that magic source that protects their business and allows them to withstand competition. How is it that Coca-Cola has been around for 100 years with margins over 20%, returns on capital over 25%, and been able to grow at more than 10% a year? It's a phenomenal business. And what we're trying to do the whole time is find these type of businesses. We look for management teams that act as stewards of our capital. Remember, when you give us your capital, we're effectively acting as stewards of your capital and your investors' capital. The same goes when we give, we invest in a company on the stock exchange, when we're buying... Um, Steinhoff or Anglo-American or Capitec, we're effectively giving your money to the management teams of the companies that we invest in 
They become stewards of yours and our capital. So we have to hold them to very high regard. And the last and the most important is margin of safety. Always, always, always invest with a margin of safety. Make sure that what you, the price that you pay is always less than the value you're getting. Because we're often going to get it wrong, and when we get it wrong, we want to make sure we can get our money, our money back. A different way of skinning this is looking at quality versus price. There's two factors. Two of the factors are quality. We're looking for above average quality businesses at below average prices. Now, that's what we call a quality anomaly. And you can ask me the question, how can we get it right? How can you buy above average quality at below average prices? And typically, the only way we can execute on that is to buy when there's fear, uncertainty, misunderstanding, or there are pockets of the market where certain people can't invest. That's a good example is, say, for instance, the mid-cap space in South Africa, where your larger asset managers, just by pure virtue of the size of their asset base, can't invest in these, in these, type, of, these type of opportunities. That creates an, an, an opportunity, an anomaly, for the smaller players to invest in. So in investing in uncertainty is a prerequisite. It's something that is essential for us. And the analogy that I use often is, um, I read the other day, they interviewed a, a, a famous bank robber, and they said to him, why do you rob banks? And he said, but, but that's where the money is. And we can say the same thing. It's very, very simple, and it sounds very obvious. But the same thing is, why, do we, why are we attracted to uncertainty? Why are we attracted to fear? Because that's where the opportunities are. And the good news is that there's still good opportunities in the market because there's still fear out there. And that's what our job is to try and find that. Um, this is a, an example of the quality anomaly that we talk about. If you look at the price earnings ratio of the equity fund, this is the, 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 the fund that Sean runs. The price earnings ratio, which is a measure of valuation, is currently around 12 and a half times. When you look at the companies that we're investing in, and Sean's going to put up the top 10, we think those companies are at least as good as the market, as the average company in the market, but we think in many cases much better. The market is trading at 18 times earnings. The opportunities we find are trading at around 12 and a half times. That's the quality anomaly, above average quality price, uh, above average quality opportunities at below average price. Now when you look at the top 10 that Sean's going to show you, you're going to think, wow, those are dull. Those are, I can't believe that you're investing in those type of companies because I'm reading about them for all the wrong reasons on the, pa on the front pages of the newspaper. But remember, if you're reading about it for the wrong reasons, our, our in, in, our instant, in, our in our opinion, they're often for the right reasons. It's pushed down the share prices to a good attractive levels where we can exploit that quality anomaly. The second is to have a large investable universe. Um, it's mathematically proven that the bigger you are in terms of your asset base, the fewer number of opportunities you can invest in. Simple maths. Um, every rand that you take in, there's ultimately there's a trade-off in terms of how many opportunities you can invest in. If you're investing in 100 billion rands worth, of, if you've got 100 billion rands worth of assets under management, uh, you can invest in 29 companies on the Janusburg Stock Exchange with any conviction. It's not a very big universe. Um, if you've got 8 billion rands worth of assets under management, that number goes up to 128. So we'd rather be investing in 128 opportunities than 29. This has been masked a bit over the last five years because some of the large cap, uh, blue chip type companies have been very good performers, and they've got lots of liquidity in that. But if Sean is right in terms of what he'll talk about in a couple of minutes and he tells you these, these shares are overpriced, um, we think that the opportunity set is starting to run out and those 29 names, are, that pool is starting to dim uh, diminish. If you look globally as we do, that opportunity set goes up to over 1,000 companies. And that's a great opportunity for us to get the odds in our favor by exploiting a co that quality anomaly over a larger universe of opportunities. We've been investing in global equity since 2006 in our funds. And you look at all of our funds, all of our funds have got a portion of global equities in them. And that global equi those global equities are direct equities. We own direct offshore equities. Um, in fact, we're up to our, our maximum limit in, in most of our funds. Why? Because we think there's a great opportunity out there. Um, but there's also a good reason, diversification. We can spread our investors' risks over a greater number of companies, geographies, countries, and currencies. You don't have all your eggs in one basket. It's not all tied to the RAND. It's not all tied to you know, a certain segment of, of, your, of, your, of your capital base. But these are great opportunities. Why wouldn't one want to exploit them? And I'll give you an example of this. 
you know, two years ago, it was actually two and a half years ago, when we stood up um, at the Outlook in 2012, we talked about Microsoft. Sean actually stood up and talked about it. Uh, it was actually, um, I remember him, you know, looked around at the audience and people looked at Microsoft and they thought, you guys are, you know, idiots. We've read about, you know, Apple taking market share in, 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 the, in, in the PC environment. The PC's dead. It so happened that Microsoft at that stage, we were sitting in Cape Town, it was a $200 billion market cap company, large company, um, over 40 analysts covering this company in the US, very well covered. And we often ask the question, you know, what, you know, how can you, sitting in Cape Town, invest globally and try and beat, you know, these smart people offshore? But for us, it was a very, very simple story. It was a very, very simple investment case. It was trading at eight times, oh, it was trading at around 10 times earnings, price earnings ratio, had $40 billion of cash on the balance sheet. It was like a rock solid balance sheet. And a wall of water or a moat around it, which we thought was one of the best business models that we'd seen in all the companies that we'd invested in over 15 years. Margins of 60%, still growing. Market shares of 90%, absolutely category killers. And an amazing hook in their customer. 90% of their business was actually selling to corporates. It wasn't selling to the consumers, the man in the street, where the, where the Apple iPad was actually you know, making, making, you know, making inroads. And when we looked at that and we brought it all together, when you adjust it for the cash in the balance sheet, Microsoft was trading at eight times earnings. The average company, the average company in the Janus, Janusberg Stock Exchange at that stage was trading at 14 or 15 times earnings. So yeah, yeah, you had this quality anomaly, a company which we looked at and we thought, wow, this is as good as we're going to find anywhere in the world with a rock solid balance sheet trading at half the multiple of the average company in the JSC. And we bought and we bought quite aggressively. But it was a hard sell. It was a hard sell. It was a very dull story as well, but it was a hard sell. That was the, the share price was at 23. It's now at $46. So a company the size of Microsoft, $200 billion, has actually doubled in size. And that's an amazing opportunity for our investor, very low, low risk opportunity. So if we really want to do well, we've got to find where we have an edge, where we've got this opportunity, and then we bet, we bet quite big. And we look for asymmetry. We thought there was very little downside and lots of upside. And if we do that, this was a buy high in our portfolios, five, six percentage points.